Joining me today is a student, an activist, and the director of high school outreach for Turning Point USA, Kyle Kashuv, welcome to The Rubin Report. Thanks for having me on. I am excited to have you here. We've met a couple times. We've done some events together. You are seemingly wise beyond your years. <laughs> Thanks. So, all right, I don't know if that's true. Thank yeah, you. all right, let's get to it. Well, actually, I mean, in, in a weird way, I guess you've been, you've been sort of thrust into being wise beyond your years. You were obviously a, a survivor of the Parkland shooting. Uh, as you know, I had your classmate, Cameron Kasky, on a couple weeks ago, and he kind of laid out uh, what happened to him that day and subsequently everything that's happened. So let's just start there because that's kind of what put you on the map. Okay. Uh, so to preface it, um, I, don't like to, I don't like to refer myself as a survivor because I wasn't in the building that was shot into. And I think that, you know, cheapens the pain and tragedy of the people who were in the building. Uh, so what happened with me that day, it was fourth period. Uh, I, I was in, I was in uh, my fourth period class uh, and all of a sudden the alarms uh, ring. So we go into the hallway. Uh, and we're walking out, and we hear two like two little uh, pops. I don't know if two textbooks fell, you know, fire fireworks. I really had no idea. So we run back, uh, and I go and reach for for the uh, the door to my classroom, and, and the uh, the teacher locked it. So we go into a nearby room. We get in there, and we just hide uh, for two hours straight. We just hear pops and ambulances uh, in the distance. So that was the uh, freshman building, and the entire time we had no idea what was going on, uh, and then. All throughout the entire time, people uh, immediately are just villainizing guns. You know, the second we got, the second I got out of the uh, the closet that I was in, kids were like, "We have to ban AR-15s." Yeah, wait, uh, let, let's not jump into the political part. Yeah, because so, it's like, because it's interesting. Just listening to you hear about that, it's almost like the way you were describing it. It almost sounds like you weren't even there. Like it's just like a story that you were telling in a in a bizarre way. So once. Okay, so all of this happens. You find out now there are, there are dead students. I mean, did you have friends yeah, that were so, killed and, and all that? So we get, out of the, we get out of the closet. SWAT takes us out. They put their you know, AR-15s in our faces, take us out. We have to put our hands on the person in front of us walking outside. Uh, and all throughout this, the most disgusting thing was every single corner of the entire block surrounding us was just filled with media cars. It was just like jam-packed. And what I saw there was that whenever there was like someone crying, or like a moment of pain, the media would just surround them and encapsulate mm. them. Uh, and I, I, I got home, and I was really hoping that this wouldn't be like a politicized spectacle with like mass, uh, you know, media jumping the gun to everything. Uh, and sadly, that was the case. So when I was like sitting there in shock, seeing the numbers rise on the screens for the death count, it was like so insane to internalize like what had just occurred because like everyone's always, you know, this will never happen to my school. How could this happen to my school? Uh, and the sad reality is it can happen to any school. Like, I mean, Stoneman Douglas was in the most affluent, low crime, you know, city, I think, in like southern Florida. Mm -hmm. And this happened at our school. Did you know some of the kids that were killed? Yeah, I, I knew one girl, Helena. Uh, she was in a class of mine a year back. Yeah. So what kind of time did you guys have to grieve? Because that, you're, you're already alluding to this. But it was like, it was as if the event happened, the shooting happened, and then it seemingly... There was no grieving, and then you guys were all over the television, you were all over Twitter, you had all political people using you guys in all sorts of different ways. Just tell me a little bit about just kind of the grieving and trying to be able to be, how old are you now? 17. You're 17, trying to be 16, 15, 16, 17 year old kids, trying to just survive something unimaginably horrible. Yeah, I don't know how freshmen and sophomores like have managed to go through this. Like I'm, I'm at least, a I was a junior at the time, so I, I knew the school a little bit better and like somewhat of my self-esteem was a little more build up more and a little bit more mature. Uh, but there was absolutely like no time to grieve whatsoever. Like a few days after the shooting, they already bust us up to Tallahassee to, you know, kind of like push to like tug on the emotional heartstrings of Republicans to pass legislation that they otherwise wouldn't have passed. Who, who's they in that equation? So there were some uh, members uh, in, in the Florida Senate uh, that like personally like coordinated buses um, from Parkland to Tallahassee. Yeah, and what were your parents saying, or the friends, you know, friends' parents, like, it just seemed like the parents were almost gone. Now, now there are some of the parents that are a little more high profile that I, that I see, but it was as if you guys were just like taken. That's what it felt like. Suddenly we're seeing you on CNN and town halls, and I want to talk a little bit about that, mm -hmm. but just like that you were just used all over the place with not even having a moment to just digest what happened. So, so here's how, I don't think that necessarily so, so here's what I think would happen. I think that the kids saw what happened, they were shocked as they should be, and they decided to act. 
Like we said, this can't happen to anyone else ever again. Let's do something. You know, what, what really occurred is that the mainstream media jumped, jumped on this immediately uh, and just like put it to like a national scale and, and really used it to push a gun control agenda. And that's why I started speaking out, because I wanted to represent the other side of Stone Douglas who doesn't believe in gun control. Yeah, so just tell me a little bit about you in high school before this. Yeah, like, like we've what, jumped a yeah, lot. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah what, what, what was Kyle Kashuv like before this? Because I know you sort of as a political beast now and like a wickedly incisive Twitterer and like, you know, you've put on events that I've been part of and, I, and you're incredibly organized and connecting with great people and all that stuff. But just tell me about the, the kid before that day. So I'll give you all the recap. Yeah. So I'll give you the story of my life. In like the a life short story, let's yeah. go. Yeah. So, uh, so my parents uh, came from Israel. Uh, they immigrated here. My dad, my mom served in the IDF. Uh, they came here with nothing, worked their way up. Uh, and then when I, was, when I was at home, they taught me Hebrew and English. So we only spoke Hebrew at home, so I'm fluent in Hebrew. Uh, and they put me through school, and I was always the shortest kid in the grade. So I was like, always like, I was just like even shorter than the shortest girl in my grade. I was like super <laughs> short. Uh -huh. And like, what was it? In like, in like eighth grade, I was four foot eight. I was like legally a midget Whoa. in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I got bullied a lot. Like I try not to have a victimhood mentality because I don't think it's, it's successful. And I think you agree with me on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was always bullied and I was always extreme. I was always smart. So that kind of went back on me a little bit. <laughs> but I was always bullied a lot and it built up my self-esteem. Uh, in addition, I was always like taking the, the uh, hardest classes. My parents would always push me to take the hardest classes possible. Um, so at Douglas, before all this, uh, you know, I had somewhat of, I had a good social life. Uh, so I would basically I would go to school, do my AP classes, go home, play video games till like 10, 10 p.m., start homework to like start homework, you know, and then finish it at 2 a.m. Uh -huh. and then have like five hours of sleep. Jeez. So that was my cycle. It was terrible. Yeah. But I was like super addicted to video games. And then the shooting happens and just turned my entire life upside down. So it just completely changed me. So at that moment, you know, I had to become much more mature. I, had, I was living in the adult world. You know, I had responsibilities. There were things I had to do. You know, I had to act a proper certain way. And, you know, uh, did you have any particular political beliefs before all this? Because you're definitely, in terms of at least the, the kids or the young people that are public about uh -huh. all of this now that have come out of Stoneman Douglas, I mean, you definitely are the one that seem, at least that I know of, is, is the furthest right that is sort of embraced conservatism and all that. Did, is that where you were politically? So Did here's, you the, thing think about, about here's the thing about me. Um, my parents aren't political at all whatsoever. So all my political beliefs I've developed myself. Uh, and how I develop every single political belief is just I look at it straight from a rational, logical point of view with no emotions whatsoever. I think you can guess I'm not an emotional person. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I think with, with legislative decisions, you have to put emotion as far out of it as possible. You have to do policies that, that actually solve the problem, not just make you feel good. So I'm, I'm really not, a, not for like feel good policies. Yeah. I, I, but did you care about politics at all before any of this or is this new sense? Yeah, I, I did care. The 2016 election, I was, I was somewhat into it. After the election, I kind of didn't care as much. But I was always like somewhat of a Second Amendment supporter. Um, yeah, but when I, when I started speaking out, so what's really interesting, when I started speaking out, uh, it was like a tidal wave of opposition. You know, I had my school was against me. Some would seem like that. You know, all my peers were against me. And I try not to do a victim of mentality, but I just want to paint the picture of how it actually was. And yeah. it seemed like the community, the mainstream media, my friends, you know, it seemed like I was going against every single opposition. You know, I was scared, like, this could, this could r ruin my life. But, you know, I believed in what I was doing, and I just powered through it. Uh, and, and just really, I just stuck to my beliefs and didn't let anyone tell me otherwise. Because, you know, when I was, so when I was in Tallahassee, uh, when they were pushing Republican legislators to, to enact gun control legislation, I said, look, gun control isn't going to solve the problem. I want to solve the problem. Okay, I want to make sure that school, school shootings never happen. What can I do to actually make that happen? And what can I do while protecting the Second Amendment? Because I actually believe it's one of the most fundamental rights of Americans. So while I was there, I started speaking out and nobody cared. Like, I would go to reporters and nobody cared. So I had to forcefully, you know, like talk to reporters, say, hey, look, I'm a conservative, can I reach out? And then I, I managed to get uh, Leland Vitter, uh, a contact with Leland Vitter at Fox. And I went on Fox and I did an interview. 
and then Ben Shapiro saw it and it blew up. But all the while... That, that's the first time I remember seeing it. Yeah, and all yeah. the while there was this extreme opposition. Um, and the entire thing that I've, well, I've always had... Sorry, where are you no, Well, I just want to know, what do you... Because I know you, you kind of mock the media the way I do now on, on Twitter and just sort of what mainstream media has become and that they're really activists and not journalists and that whole thing. Um, but were you shocked when you were going up to them and going, you know, I'm a conservative or I want to defend the Second Amendment, but I'm a, I'm a student from this school. And they're just bl blatantly yeah. ignoring you. Or even, I know this is minor, but like I remember when a bunch of you guys were all verified on Twitter at once. I but, wasn't. But you weren't. Yeah. And it was and like that, you that were the outlier. With, with Instagram as well. It took me like three months after everyone else. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that, it doesn't really mean it anything doesn't in and of itself. Yeah. But it is, it is a symptom of sort of the broader situation going on here with tech companies and media and all that? Like, were they flat out ignoring you? Like, you saw them interviewing people and then... So, here was, here, here, here's what occurred. Uh, the main organizers of that, that you see, like, were the solid group of, like, the March for Our Live kids. Yeah. At this point, they had solidified a clique, and they wouldn't let anyone new or with a, a different opposing view into it. So I said, I have to take matters into my own hand. In addition, when we were in Tallahassee, I realized that the mainstream media is just doing this for clicks. Because, can we think about it? When mass shooting occurs, the mainstream media loves it. Like they get great coverage. They get great amount of views. They do. Um, I'll switch. I'll talk to like notoriety in addition after this. But mm -hmm. I saw that when someone there was a girl crying in Tallahassee, and the second she cried, just she got sworn by reporters. And I saw that they were just looking for for clicks and for headlines. And, um, and I realized that they're really they're not in it for the right reasons, and they're not going to listen to a rational a rational young kid like me. Okay. Yeah. So in addition, I also realized that there was an extreme amount of just people were just getting, benefiting off of this so much. Um, so after the shooting, we realized that a lot of this occurred because the shooter, who I, I try not to say his name ever because I think that gives him to notoriety. Doesn't matter. They, 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 would, they would post, so here's what Time did. So the video of the shooter where he basically says, you know, I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. Uh, I want 20 people. And he basically says, you're all going to see me on the news. So, and then Time Magazine puts this video up on YouTube. It gets 3.6 million views. Mm -hmm. The same thing with all the other videos. You know, CNN talked about this exact clip and basically just still showed it on air. Yeah. So the entire thing what the mainstream media is doing is that they're basically, they're just benefiting off the situation. And what they don't realize is they're perpetuating the issue and making it worse. That's why I think Daily Wire, uh, Ben is doing a great decision with not showing their names and faces because it's an ethical decision. Yeah. Now I don't think government should impose on on you know on the mainstream media to not allow to show their faces, but I think it's an ethical and moral decision that people should be taking up. Yeah. So just to be totally clear, so after this shooting, that was when Ben announced he's the editor yeah, the of Daily Wire. They are no longer going to yeah, show days, their names. Yeah, or a pictures. few days after. Yeah. So. Okay, so you started to see this, this issue with the media, that they're ignoring people like you and they're sort of making other people stars and they're going for the clicks and all of that. What about, you know, I, I don't want to make this about people per se, but so that, that little click of, of kids that then was all over the media and was getting retweeted by every celebrity and all of that, were you trying to reach out to them at all and just have that discussion, or was it just very clear that Oh, no, yeah, that that absolutely, and I happen? still try to have that discussion. You know, when they first started speaking out, I said, oh, my God, that's great, someone's speaking out. And originally, when the movement started, speak, when it started, you know, you remember Cameron Kasky was on, on the car shouting, the movement wasn't an anti-gun movement. It was an anti-school shooting movement. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, guys, this is quickly, I, just, I was like, I gave them a warning, guys, it looks like you're moving to the direction of an anti-gun movement. And I don't think that's beneficial at all. So here's my point of view. And I tried communicating and I, and I tried speaking. Uh, and they really didn't care in allowing me. So I said, OK, I have to go solo. And that's what I've been doing. But I, I've, I've always been open to discussion and open debate. I think it's one of the great things of our country where you can have you know, open discussion. Uh, and just free expression of ideas. That's why I think the Kanye thing is somewhat great, because <laughs> regardless of what you think of the person or celebrity, um, I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not in favor of propping up celebrities and their political opinions simply because they're famous, but you don't need a lot of political expertise to say that I believe in free expression, free thought. Right, that's, that shouldn't be a really controversial position to be, to be staking out. All right, so you mentioned Cameron, and you know I had him on the show a couple yeah. weeks ago. He's going through a very interesting evolution right now. 
I suspect I can figure out where this is going to end up, which actually be much closer to your position than the position that he's sort of at right now, because I just continually see that as the evolution of things, the more that he understands rights and all of those things. But I was happy to hear his thoughts and all that. And look, he sat down with me, he sat down with Shapiro, and I think he'll continue to do that. Um, have you guys been able to make any peace with some of this yeah, stuff? Or, uh, or you must at least be enjoying the fact that somebody's kind of coming around to No, I think, I think Cam's a good guy. I think that what we're seeing right now is that he's matured. I mean, we've all made, so me, me and Cam have gone through like the same political slash media you know, experience so we can understand each other. Uh, what happened with Cam is like, look, we've all made mistakes. We've all said stuff we don't want to, but he's matured and I've also matured. Uh, and what I see, what I think is happening with Cam is it's the natural progression of just having logical thought instead of emotions. And I think logic and facts moves you towards the political beliefs of being a conservative. Okay, so all of this happens. I think the, the sort of rock bottom of this was that CNN town hall. That was terrible. Um, yeah, just share your thoughts on that. So here's what happened with the CNN town hall. So a lot of the kids that you saw there were actually flown in on a private jet from Tallahassee. So already at the time of the town hall, there was a solidified group click of, of the kids that you see now, and they won't let anything in. So they actually flew these kids on a private jet from Tallahassee uh, to the town hall. And right there, it, it, was, it was just simply, they were just, it, it was an anti-gun debate, and they were just villainizing Rubio and Dana Lash for things that had nothing into their control yeah. whatsoever. It wasn't their fault. And Marco Rubio was villainized to such an extreme extent, and he's one of the best senators. Uh, so you've now connected with Rubio. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate it because p when people say that politicians just don't care, it's just so wrong. I mean, politicians, they do care. Um, and, you know, he was one of the greatest supporters of the Stop School Violence Act that we got passed. Um, and he just helped push it. And, look, these senators don't want this to occur to anyone. And just saying that politicians want this to happen is just wrong. Do you have any thoughts on uh, what actually happened that day in terms of security or what should have happened or should have, shouldn't have happened? Because even now, when you go back and listen, depending on where you're getting your news from this, it sounds, you know, they either stepped down or they didn't go in or this or that or the other thing. And it's like, well, well, what, what should have happened in, in the ideal world that, that you want to create and the system that you want to create to protect this, these schools from not having this happen again? Um, what, what should have happened that day? What we saw in my school was simply and utterly just massive incompetence and failure of law enforcement. You know, the sh the, so the shooter was flagged multiple times by the school, by the school administration. They knew he had mental issues. He was put into the Promise program. Um, and they knew that this kid was a threat. There were 76 times the police, there were 76 times the police came to his house. There were two FBI reports. They knew that this kid was a threat. And the law enforcement was just completely incompetent at that level. And they didn't do absolutely anything. Everyone knew this kid was an issue. What happened at the school was, was just utter incompetence in addition. So when he gets on campus, okay, he just makes a straight beeline for the freshman building. And at the exact same time, we had a school resource officer who, who, who heard the gunfire and came, and he just hid in a corner while kids were dying. And then three unarmed individuals rushed to save, three, three unarmed went to the building and died trying to save kids. What we should have had, and this is why I push for it, the only way to stop a shooter who is active on campus is to have other people who are armed. The only way to stop, it's not a cliche, the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And in addition to that, there's the entire idea of a gun-free gun -free zone. It is utterly stupid. Yeah. It is just completely stupid. All it's doing is enticing a target, saying, look, you go here, so here's, here's what's the school. The average response time from a police station to a school nationally is 15 minutes. The average time a school shooting happens is five minutes. That means the shooter has 15 minutes to do whatever he wants if the school is a gun-free zone. So here's what I'm saying. At least allow teachers who have gone through the proper training, you know, ex-military, um, ex-law enforcement, to be armed. Because what that does is it sends not only a message as a deterrent to a shooter that says, look, this school is armed. If you get in here, your brains are going to be blown out. It also says that 
that the school is in a gun free the school is no longer a gun free zone. So I'm I'm with you partly on that. So what I would maybe and maybe you can explain this a little bit further. So I don't know that I want guns in those classrooms, even if. It's so here's a, the interesting, license, here's the interesting yeah. thing. There are 25 states where teachers can be armed and are armed in schools. Mm -hmm. And all the hypotheticals that are pronounced, it's like, you know, what if a teacher shoots a student when there's another, like, like what if there's mm -hmm. a school shooter and a teacher gets shot and there's a gun on the floor, what does a student do? It's, these hypotheticals don't happen. 25 states where teachers are already armed and it works. So why not just have them have security guards at specific uh, no, locations So outside. here's the thing, I'm all for having security guards. This yeah. entire issue is how do we best manage our funds and secure our schools? Mm -hmm. The thing with law enforcement officers is that they cost a lot of money. And impoverished schools already need that funding for, for materials. And in addition, it does not take a lot of training and a lot of money to have a teacher to be armed, and this has already been proven to work. And in addition, when you have teachers who are armed, the shooter doesn't know who it is. If, you, if it's a law enforcement officer, you can clearly see who it is. So if you have one resource officer, school resource officer who's armed, the shooter comes and takes out the school resource officer, and then they're free to do whatever. Yeah. But it's simply, so here's the thing, simply giving teachers to have the opportunity has a massive effect, because it's up to their own will to do so. They have to go through training, and they have to, it's a concealed carry. So nobody knows they have them. So as you said before, you, you like facts and logic, okay? Yeah, you like, I'm you strictly facts. Facts no don't feelings. care about your feelings. I All right, that. I got you. That, that, that works. When, when you've engaged some of your friends and, and other students about these ideas, I mean, everyone watching this at this point knows that so much of what's coming out of the modern left is about feelings and all mm -hmm. these things. Do you have a sense that they understand that young people, at least the ones you're talking to, understand like what rights are, what, why, why we should care about these things, why free speech matters, why the Second Amendment matters, and, and things of that nature? So, or does it all just sound good to them and there's a... It's, uh, that's pretty much it. It makes them feel good. You know, what they push, it makes them feel good by their emotions, it makes sense. So here's the thing. I am very scared of lowering the age for people to vote to be 15. Like, that scares me because the kids that I know who are 15 know absolutely nothing about politics. I think I know, like, the kids from the March for Our Lives better than, I think I know their own arguments better than they know their own arguments. Like, I can argue yeah. for them better than they can do. So I strictly use facts only. Um, so when I make an argument with them, I can really know what they're going to do next. So here's how, I'll give you, like, a 10-minute or 5-minute recap sure. of basically how I premise the Second Amendment argument. Yeah. In America we have the right to bear arms. In DC versus Heller, that right ruled that an individual's right to bear arms doesn't mean the militia. The militia clause is different from the individual right to bear arms. That means that you personally have the right to arm yourself. Okay, there are about 270 million guns in the United States. 15 million of those are AR-15s. So we look at the gun stats, there are 33,000 uh, annual gun deaths. 66%, so two thirds, uh, or suicide, so it leaves us with 11,000 gun deaths. Uh, so we have, to, so in addition, I put in parentheses, there's a difference between a homicide and a murder. So a homicide is, is just a killing, a murder is an unlawful killing. And gun stats, a lot of them like to perverse this into skew statistics. So 3% of all gun deaths are with rifles. Okay, and in that 3%, 68% of those are suicides. So 1% of all gun deaths are actual uh, murders or actually, sorry, yeah, or actually murders with rifles. 80% uh, of all gun crime related activity is with illegal firearms. Uh, most school, sh most shootings are with pistols. So, so the March for Lives has five bullet points. Uh, one of them is, like, I'll talk about, I like to talk about the CDC, and we should allow the CDC to do research. The issue with that is the CDC has already proven to skew statistics and, and to not actually provide good research. What, what research is it that they want the so CDC to the do? So the CDC used to be able to do research on, on gun violence prevention and just figure out what's going on, but it's been proven time and time again that they skew their statistics. So the federal government was like, no, we're not allowing you to perpetuate a false myth. Uh, so a myth. Uh, so basically they stopped funding. The next thing is that they want high capacity magazines. Uh, there is no distinction, there, there is no difference that shows that high capacity magazines, whatever that means, can do more damage than simply having more like clips, mm -hmm. um, just, having small, just having larger clips but less of them. There's no distinction that it actually does more damage. The next thing that they want to do is ban semi-auto rifles. As I've said before, only 3% 
of all gun deaths are with rifles, so banning them does absolutely nothing. Addressing the issue and lowering uh, gun violence is making sure that we have uh, making sure that we have more people who are armed, because there's a direct uh, correlation, not causation, but correlation, that when we increase firearm um, ownership and concealed carry permits in addition, um, violent crime goes down. So the next thing they like to propose is what about Great Britain and Australia? So in Great Britain, there was a, there was a ban on guns, and immediately after, violent crime spiked. Uh, and in addition, you have armed robberies um, increased, so violent crime increased immediately after. And burglaries in Great Britain, 60% uh, of them occur when the, the individual's at home versus 13% in the U.S. So huh. burglars have admitted that they do this because they know that the person will have like their purse or, or whatever and they won't, they'll be unarmed. So violent crime spike. The next thing is they say, hey Kyle, what about the Australian gun buy program? So already in Australia when, when the program was initiated, there was already statistical zero uh, for uh, you know, gun death and, and public, mass public school shootings. Um, so in addition, when the buyback gets implemented, there already were like there were millions, millions less guns in Australia than there were now. So the gun buyback goes in, only one third of guns get taken. Uh, and what we saw immediately after the buyback was that violent crime spiked. So here's just the basic argument. There has not been one single occurrence where gun control gets passed and, and, and gun deaths, no, sorry, gun homicides actually decreases at a faster rate. In Australia, the gun the homicide rate was already decreasing at a really good rate. Mm -hmm. It gets past the gun control and th the rate stalls. So it actually hurt. Uh, in addition, immediately after it was passed, the violent crime rates go up and the national trend was going down. So the gun buyback program was completely ineffective, did absolutely nothing, and then it, it, it failed on such a huge level in Australia that implementing it in the US with 270 million guns simply won't work.